All right, so we are going to start reading The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin. Chapter 1, Sunset Towers. The sun sets in the west, just about everyone knows that, but Sunset Towers faced east. Strange. Sunset Towers faced east and had no towers. This glittery, glassy apartment house stood alone on the Lake Michigan shore five stories high. Five empty stories high. Then one day, it happened to be the 4th of July, a most uncommon looking delivery boy rode around town, slipping letters under the doors of the chosen tenants to be. The letters were signed Barney Northrup. The delivery boy was 62 years old and there was no such person as Barney Northrup. Dear lucky one, here it is, the apartment you've always dreamed of at a rent you can afford in the newest, most luxurious building on Lake Michigan. Sunset Towers, picture windows in every room, uniform doorman, maid service, central air conditioning, high-speed elevator, exclusive neighborhood near excellent schools, etc., etc. You have to see it to believe it. But these unbelievably elegant apartments will be shown by appointment only, so hurry, there are only a few left. Call me now at 276-7474 for this once-in-a-lifetime offer. Your servant, Barney Northrup. P.S. I am also renting ideal space for doctor's office in lobby, coffee shop with entrance from parking lot, high-class restaurant on entire top floor. Six letters were delivered, just six. Six appointments were made, and one by one, family by family, talk, 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 Barney Northrup led the tours around and about Sunset Towers. Take a look at all that glass, one-way glass, Barney Northrup said. You can see out, nobody can see in. Looking up, the Wexlers, the first appointment of the day, were blinded by the blast of morning sun that flashed off the face of the building. See those chandeliers? Crystal, Barney Northrup said, slicking his black mustache and straightening his hand-painted tie in the lobby's mirrored wall. How about this carpeting? Three inches thick. Gorgeous, Mrs. Wexler replied, clutching her husband's arm as her high heels wobbled in the deep plush pile. She, too, managed an approving glance in the mirror before the elevator door opened. You're really in luck, Barney Northrup said. There's only one apartment left, but you'll love it. It was meant for you. He flung open the door to 3D. Now is that breathtaking or is that breathtaking? Mrs. Wexler gasped. It was breathtaking, all right. Two walls of the living room were floor to ceiling glass. Following Barney Northrup's lead, she ooed and awed her joyous way through the entire apartment. Her trailing husband was less enthusiastic. What's this, a bedroom or a closet? Jake Wexler asked, peering into the last room. It's a bedroom, of course, his wife replied. It looks like a closet. Oh, Jake, this apartment is perfect for us, just perfect, Grace Wexler argued in a whining coup. The third bedroom was a trifle small, but it would do just fine for Turtle. And think what it means having your office in the lobby, Jake. No more driving to and from work, no more mowing the lawn or shoveling snow. Let me remind you, Barney Northrup said, the rent here is cheaper than what your old house costs in upkeep. How would he know that, Jake wondered. Grace stood before the front window, where beyond the road, beyond the trees, Lake Michigan lay calm and glistening. A lake view. Just wait until those so-called friends of hers with their classy houses see this place. The furniture would have to be reupholstered. No, she'd buy new furniture. Beige velvet. And she'd have stationery made, blue with a deckle edge, her name and fancy address and swirling type across the top. Grace Windsor Wexler, Sunset Towers on the lake shore. Not every tenant-to-be was quite as overjoyed as Grace Windsor Wexler. Arriving in the late afternoon, Seidel Pulowski looked up and saw only the dim, warped reflections of treetops and drifting clouds in the glass face of Sunset Towers. You're really in luck, Barney Northrup said for the sixth and last time. There's only one apartment left, but you'll love it. It was meant for you. He flung open the door to a one-bedroom apartment in the rear. Now is that breathtaking or is that breathtaking? Not especially, Seidel Pulowski replied as she blinked into the rays of the summer sun setting behind the parking lot. She had waited all these years for a place of her own, and here it was, in an elegant building where rich people lived. But she wanted a lake view. The front apartments are taken, Barney Northrup said. Besides, the rent's too steep for a secretary's salary. Believe me, you get the same luxuries here at a third of the price. At least the view from the side window was pleasant. Are you sure nobody can see in? Seidel Pulowski asked. Absolutely, Barney Northrup said, following her suspicious stare to the mansion on the North Cliff. That's just the old Westinghouse up there. It hasn't been lived in for 15 years. 
Well, I'll have to think it over. I have 20 people begging for this apartment, Barney Northrop said, lying through his buck teeth. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. Whoever, whatever else he was, Barney Northrop was a good salesman. In one day, he had rented all of Sunset Towers to the people whose names were already printed on the mailbox in an alcove off the lobby. Office, Dr. Wexler. Lobby, Theodoricus Coffee Shop. 2C, F. Baumbach. 2D, Theodoricus. 3C, S. Pulowski. 3D, Wexler. 4C, who? 4D, J.J. Ford. 5, Shin Hu's Restaurant. Who were these people? These specially selected tenants? They were mothers and fathers and children? A dressmaker, a secretary, an inventor, a doctor, a judge? Oh, yes, one was a bookie, one was a burglar, one was a bomber, and one was a mistake. Barney Northrup had rented one of the apartments to the wrong person. All right, chapter two, ghosts or worse. On September 1st, the chosen ones and the mistake moved in. A wire fence had been erected along the north side of the building. On it, a sign warned, no trespassing, property of the Westing estate. The newly paved driveway curved sharply and doubled back on itself rather than breach the city county line. Sunset Towers stood at the far edge of town. On September 2nd, Shin Hu's restaurant, specializing in authentic Chinese cuisine, held its grand opening. Only three people came. It was indeed an exclusive neighborhood, too exclusive for Mr. Hu. However, the less expensive coffee shop that opened on the parking lot was kept busy serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner to tenants ordering up and to workers from nearby Westingtown. Sunset Towers was a quiet, well-run building, and, except for the grumbling Mr. Hu, the people who lived there seemed content. Neighbor greeted neighbor with good morning or good evening or a friendly smile and grappled with small problems behind closed doors. The big problems were yet to come. Now it was the end of October. A cold, raw wind whipped dead leaves about the ankles of the four people grouped in the Sunset Towers driveway, but not one of them shivered. Not yet. The stocky, broad-shouldered man in the doorman's uniform, standing with feet spread, fists on hips, was Sandy McSuthers. The two slim, trim high school seniors, shielding their eyes against the stinging chill, were Theo Theodoricus and Doug Who. The small, wiry man pointing to the house on the hill was Otis Amber, the 62-year-old delivery boy. They faced north, gaping like statues cast in the moment of discovery, until Turtle Wexler, her kite tail of a braid flying behind her, raced her bicycle into the driveway. Look, look, there's smoke, there's smoke coming from the chimney of the Westinghouse. The others had seen it. Why did, what did she think they were looking at anyway? Turtle leaned on the handlebars, panting for breath. Sunset Towers was near excellent schools, as Barney Northrop had promised, but the junior high was four miles away. Do you think, do you think old man Westing's up there? Nah, Otis Amber, the delivery boy answered. Nobody's seen him for years. Supposed to be living on a private island in the South Seas, he is. But most folks say he's dead, long gone dead. They say his corpse is still up there in that big old house. They say his body is sprawled out on a fancy oriental rug and his flesh is rotting off those mean bones and maggots are creeping in his eye sockets and crawling out his nose holes. The delivery boy added a high pitched hee 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 to the gruesome details. Now someone shivered. It was Turtle. Serves him right, Sandy said. At other times, a cheery fellow, the doorman often complained bitterly about having been fired from his job of 20 years in the Westing paper mill. But somebody must be up there. Somebody alive, that is. He pushed back the gold braided cap and squinted at the house through his steel frame glasses, as if expecting the curling smoke to write the answer in the autumn air. Maybe it's those kids again. No, it couldn't be. What kids? The three kids wanted to know. Why those two unfortunate fellows from Westingtown? What unfortunate fellows? The three heads twisted from the doorman to the delivering boy. Doug who duck turtles whizzing braid. Touch her precious pigtail, even by accident, and she'll kick you in the shins, the brat. He couldn't chance an injury to his legs, not with the big meat coming. The track star began to jog in place. Horrible. It was horrible, Otis Amber said with a shudder that sent the loose straps of his le leather aviator's helmet swinging about his long, thin face. Come to think of it, it happened exactly one year ago tonight, on Halloween. What happened? Theo Theodoricus asked impatiently. He was late for work in the coffee shop. Tell them, Otis, Sandy urged. 
the delivery boy stroked the gray stubble on his pointed chin. Seems it all started with a bet. Somebody bet them a dollar they couldn't stay in that spooky house five minutes. One measly buck. The poor kids hardly got through those French doors on this side of the Westinghouse when they came tearing out like they were being chased by a ghost. Chased by a ghost, or worse. Or worse. Turtle forgot her throbbing toothache. Theo Theodoricus and Doug Who, older and more worldly wise, exchanged winks, but stayed to hear the rest of the story. One fellow ran out crazy-like, screaming his head off. He never stopped screaming till he hit the rocks at the bottom of the cliff. The other fellow hasn't said but two words since. Something about purple. Sandy helped him out. Purple waves. Otis Amber nodded sadly. Yep, that poor fellow just sits in the state asylum saying purple waves, purple waves, over and over again, and his scared eyes keep staring at his hands. You see, when he came running out of the Westinghouse, his hands were dripping with warm, wet blood. Now all three shivered. Poor kid, the doorman said, all that pain and suffering for a dollar bet. Make it two dollars for each minute I stay in there and you're on, Turtle said. Someone was spying on the group in the driveway. From the front window of apartment 2D, 15-year-old Chris Theodoricus watched his brother Theo shake hands, it must be a bet, with the skinny, one-pigtailed girl and rush into the lobby. The family coffee shop would be busy now. His brother should have been working the counter half an hour ago. Chris checked the wall clock. Two more hours before Theo would bring up his dinner. Then he would tell him about the limper. Earlier that afternoon, Chris had followed the flight of a purple martin across the field of brambles through the oaks up to the red maple on the hill. The bird flew off, but something else caught his eye. Someone, he could not tell if the person was a man or a woman, came out of the shadows on the lawn, unlocked the French doors, and disappeared into the Westinghouse. Someone with a limp. Minutes later, smoke began to rise from the chimney. Once again, Chris turned toward the side window and scanned the house on the cliff. The French doors were closed. Heavy drapes hung full against the 17 windows he had counted so many times. They didn't need drapes on the special glass windows here in Sunset Towers. He could see out, but nobody could see in. Then why did he sometimes feel that someone was watching him? Who could be watching him? God? If God was watching, then why was he like this? The binoculars fell to the boy's lap. His head jerked, his body coiled, lashed by violent spasms. Relax, Theo will come soon. Relax, soon the geese will be flying south in a V. Canada goose. Relax. Relax and watch the wind tangle the smoke and blow it toward Westingtown. Chapter 3. Tenants in and out. Upstairs in 3D, Angela Wexler stood on a hassock as still and blank-faced pretty as a store window dummy. Her pale blue eyes stared unblinkingly at the lake. Turn, dear, said Flora Bombach, the dressmaker, who lived and worked in a smaller apartment on the second floor. Angela pivoted in a slow quarter turn. Oh! Startled by the small cry, Flora Bombach dropped the pin from her pudgy fingers and almost swallowed the three in her mouth. Please be careful, Mrs. Bombach. My Angela has very delicate skin. Grace Windsor Wexler was supervising the fitting of her daughter's wedding dress from the beige velvet couch. Above her hung the two dozen framed flower prints she had selected and arranged with the greatest of taste and care. She could have been an interior decorator, a good one too, if it wasn't for the pressing demands of so on and so forth. Mrs. Bombach didn't prick me, mother, Angela said evenly. I was just surprised to see smoke coming from the Westinghouse chimney. Crawling with slow caution on her hands and knees, Flora Bombach paused in the search of the drop pin to peer up through her straight gray bangs. Mrs. Wexler set her coffee cup on the driftwood coffee table and craned her neck for a better view. We must have new neighbors. I'll have to drive up there with a housewarming gift. They may need some decorating advice. Hey, look, there's smoke coming from the Westinghouse. Again, Turtle was late with the news. Oh, it's you. Mrs. Wexler always seems surprised to see her other daughter, so unlike golden-haired, angel-faced Angela. Flora Bombach, about to rise with the found pin, quickly sank down again to protect her sore shin in the shag carpeting. She had pulled Turtle's braid in the lobby yesterday. Otis Amber says the old man Westing's stinking corpse is rotting on an oriental rug. My, oh my, Flora Bombach exclaimed, and Mrs. Wexler clicked her tongue in an irritated tsk. Turtle decided not to go on with the horror story. Not that her mother cared if she got killed or ended up a raving lunatic. Mrs. Bombach, could you hem my witch's costume? I need it for tonight. Mrs. Wexler answered, can't you see she's busy with Angela's wedding dress? And why must you wear a silly costume like that? 
Really, Turtle, I don't know why you insist on making yourself ugly. It's no sillier than a wedding dress, Turtle snapped back. Besides, nobody gets married anymore, and if they do, they don't wear silly wedding dresses. She was close to a tantrum. Besides, who would want to marry that stuck-it-up, know-it-all, marshmallow-faced Dr. Denton? That's enough of your smart mouth, Mrs. Wexler leaped up, hand ready to strike. Instead, she straightened a framed flower print, patted her fashionable honey-blonde hairdo, and sat down again. She had never hit Turtle, but one of these days, besides, a stranger was present. Dr. Deer is a brilliant young man, she explained for Flora Bombach's ears. The dressmaker smiled politely. Angela will soon be Angela Deer. Isn't that a precious name? The dressmaker nodded. And then we'll have two doctors in the family. Now, where do you think you are going? Turtle was at the front door. Downstairs to tell Daddy about the smoke coming from the Westinghouse. Come back this instant. You know your father operates in the afternoon. Why don't you go to your room and work on stock market reports or whatever you do in there? Some room. It's even too small for a closet. I'll hem your witch's costume, Turtle, Angela offered. Mrs. Wexler beamed on her perfect child draped in white. What an angel. Crow's clothes were black, her skin dead white. She looked severe, rigid, in fact, rigid and righteously severe. No one could have guessed that under her stern facade, her stomach was doing flip-flops as Dr. Wexler cut out a corn. Staring down at the fine lines of pink scalp that showed through the podiatrist's thinning, light brown hair did nothing to ease her queasiness. So, softly humming a hymn, she settled her gaze on the north window. Smoke! Watch it! Jake Wexler almost cut off her little toe along with the corn. Unaware of the near amputation, the cleaning woman stared at the Westinghouse. You will just sit back, Jake began, but his patient did not hear him. She must have been a handsome woman at one time, but life had used her harshly. Her faded hair, knotted in a tight bun on the nape of her knot neck, glinted gold-red in the light. Her profile was fine, marred only by the jut of her clenched jaw. Well, let's get on with it. Friday was his busy day. He had phone calls to make. Please sit back, Mrs. Crow. I'm almost finished. What? Jake gently replaced her foot on the chair's pedestal. I see you've hurt your shin. What? For an instant, their eyes met. Then she looked away. A shy creature, or a guilty one. Crow averted her face when she spoke. Your daughter Turtle kicked me, she muttered, staring once again at the Westinghouse. That's what happens when there is no religion in the home. Sandy says Westing's corpse is up there rotting away on an oriental rug, but I don't believe it. If he's truly dead, then he's roasting in hell. We are sinners all. What do you mean his corpse is rotting on an oriental rug? Some kind of Persian rug? Maybe a Chinese rug? Mr. Hu had joined his son at the glass sidewall of the fifth floor restaurant. And why were you wasting precious time listening to an overage delivery boy with an active imagination when you should have been studying? It was not a question. Doug's father never asked questions. Don't shrug at me. Go study. Sure, Dad. Doug jogged off through the kitchen. It was no use arguing that there was no school tomorrow, just track practice. He jogged down the back stairs, no matter what excuse he gave. Go study, his father would say. Go study. He jogged into the Who's rear apartment stretched out on the bare floor and repeated, go study, to 20 sit-ups. Only two customers were expected for the dinner hour. Shin Hu's restaurant could seat 100. Mr. Hu slammed the reservations book shut, pressed a hand against the pain in his ample stomach, unwrapped a chocolate bar, and devoured it quickly before acid etched another ulcer. Back home again, is he? Well, Westing won't get off so easy this time, not on his life. A small, delicate woman in a long white apron stood in silence before the restaurant's east window. She stared longingly into the boundless gray distance as if far, far on the other side of Lake Michigan lay China. Sandy McSuthers saluted as the maroon Mercedes swung around the curved driveway and came to a stop at the entrance. He opened the car door with ceremony reserved only for Judge J.J. Ford. Look up there, Judge, there's smoke coming from the Westinghouse. A tall black woman in a tailored suit her short clipped hair touched with gray, slipped out from behind the wheel, handed the car keys to the doorman, and cast a disinterested glance at the house on the hill. They say nobody's up there, just the corpse of old man Westing rotting away on an oriental rug. Sandy reported as he hoisted a full briefcase from the trunk of the car. Do you believe in ghosts, Judge? There is certain to be a more rational explanation. You're right, of course, Judge. Sandy opened the heavy glass door and followed on the judge's heels through the lobby. I was just repeating what Otis Amber said. Otis Amber is a stupid man, if not downright mad. J.J. Ford hurried into the elevator. 
She should not have said that. Not her. Not the first black, the first woman to have been elected to a judgeship in the state. She was tired after trying day. That was it. Or was it? So Sam Westing has come home at last. Well, she could sell the car, take out a bank loan, pay him back in cash. But would he take it? Please don't repeat what I said about Otis Amber, Mr. McSuthers. Don't worry, Judge. The doorman escorted her to the door of apartment 4D. What you tell me is strictly confidential. And it was. J.J. Fort was the biggest tipper in Sunset Towers. I saw some but but Chris Theodorcus was too excited to stutter out the news to his brother. One arm shot out and twisted up over his head. Dumb arm. Theo squatted next to the wheelchair. Listen, Chris, I'll tell you about that haunted castle on the hill. His voice was soothing and hushed in mystery. Somebody is up there, Chris. But nobody is there, just rich Mr. Westing. And he's dead. Dead as a squashed dune bug and rotting away on a moth-eaten oriental rug. Chris relaxed as he always did when his brother told him a story. Theo was good at making up stories. And the worms are crawling in and out of the dead man's skull. In and out of his ear holes, his nose holes, his mouth holes, in and out of all of his holes. Chris laughed, then quickly composed his face. He was supposed to look scared. Theo leaned closer. And high above the putrid corpse, a crystal chandelier is tinkling. It tinkles and twinkles, but not one breath of air stirs in that gloomy tomb of a room. Gloomy tomb of a room. Theo will make a good writer someday, Chris thought. He wouldn't spoil this wonderful spooky Halloween story by telling him about the real person up there, the one with the limp. So Chris sat quietly, his body at ease, and heard about ghosts and ghouls and purple waves, and smiled at his brother with pure delight. A smile that could break your heart, Seidel Pulowski, the tenant in 3C, always said. But no one paid any attention to Seidel Pulowski. Seidel Pulowski struggled out of the taxi, large and first. She was not a heavy woman, just wide-hipped from years of secretarial sitting. If only there was a ladylike way to get out of the cab. Her green rhinestone-studded glasses slipped down for her flesh from her fleshy nose as she grappled with a tall triangular package and a stuffed shopping bag. If only that lazy driver would lend her a hand. Not for a nickel tip, he wouldn't. The cabbie slammed the back door and sped around the curved driveway, narrowly missing the Mercedes that Sandy was driving in the parking lot. At least the never-there-when-you-need-him doorman had propped open the front door. Not that he ever helped her, or noticed her for that matter. No one ever noticed. Seidel Pulowski limped through the lobby. She could be carrying a high-powered rifle in that package and no one would notice. She had moved to Sunset Towers hoping to meet elegant people, but no one had invited her in for so much as a cup of tea. No one paid any attention to her except that poor crippled boy whose smile could break your heart and that bratty hit with the braid. She'll be sorry she kicked her in the shin. Juggling her load, earrings jingling and charm bracelet jangling, Seidel Pulowski unlocked the several locks to apartment 3C and bolted the door behind her. There'd be fewer burglaries here, around here if people listened to her about putting in deadbolt locks, but nobody listened, nobody cared. On the plastic-covered dining table, she set out the contents of the shopping bag, six cans of enamel, paint thinner, and brushes. She unwrapped the long package and leaned four wooden crutches against the wall. The sun was setting over the parking lot, but Seidel Pulowski did not look out her back window. From the side window, smoke could be seen rising from the Westinghouse, but Seidel Pulowski did not notice. No one ever notices Seidel Pulowski, she muttered, but now they will. Now they will. All right, so that was chapters one through three of the Westing game. So stick around for the next video and we will keep going.